today uh, uh, we are taking time to have a family conversation around uh, our finances and around our building. And uh, I, this morning I texted our church council and I, I said, I don't, I don't know if a pastor should be this excited to have a morning about these two things, uh, but I feel it. And uh, the reason is because as we've prepared for today, uh, we just see and experience the profound faithfulness of God. And I today also just recognize that uh, it's not typical for us or for a church to take an entire Sunday and and to talk about things that are organizational, uh, practical, operational. Um, but it matters to me that we, as a church family, understand the heartbeat of the stewardship of our church and that we recognize within the practical and the operational are things that are profoundly spiritual. And if you are new to our church family, whether that's just in a handful of weeks or Easter was your first Sunday or uh, this is your first Sunday. Uh, I just want you to know that while this may be a, a, an interesting, unique, strange conversation for you to feel like you are being invited into, um, I hope what it communicates is the heart of who we are and the trust that matters that we establish together as a church family. And before I dive into those details, two, two things I wanted to mention. The first was, it was in our announcements, but I specifically wanted to invite uh, the men of our church to our men's retreat. And it's happening on May 5th and 6th. Uh, and it starts on a Friday night and ends on a Saturday night. We did that distinctively to be able to drive back on that Saturday evening because I recognize from a lot of men, uh, getting away from work uh, for those who are married or have children, getting away from their family is, is not an easy task and time is precious for all of us. And we believe that we, setting aside 36 hours, could actually have a significant, a significant time together in a way that transforms and moves our lives. I believe that something happens when we get away together. Uh, I believe that when we gather, in 70 minutes, there's things that God does and can do, but I believe that things that God longs to do only happen in spaces where we allow time to go and establish the heart and the future of who we are in our relationships. And this retreat specifically, um, I feel a great sense of significance around. First, uh, it's the relaunch of our men's ministry. And during this time, we're gonna be talking about the future of who we feel called to be as men and what we believe God's asking of us uh, in the season. Um, I also just believe that God has made some promises about the way he's going to meet us and, and the way he is going to reveal his presence and that there is going to be belonging that gets created. And in the heart of men is an ache for belonging. And what I found about getting away or going on retreats is they have a way of bringing out the 13 year olds in all of us. And both in the silliness and stuff that happens at a men's retreat, there is that element of it, but also in the trepidation to go. There is this thing that somehow wakes up inside of us that causes us to resist places where we will either have to confront where we feel like we don't belong or the vulnerability to belong. And so I wanted to just tell you sincerely, you're wanted. If you can't go, if you don't want to go, you will not find pressure or manipulation from me in any way. But I did wanna take a minute and share my heart. I think it matters. If you can go, I would ask you to come. If you can't pay, just fill out a need for a scholarship on the form and we will have one for you. I believe God is gonna meet the men of this church and I believe the men of this church matter greatly and the future of who we are matters greatly connected to them. And so you are wanted and invited to come. Second, I wanted to celebrate from last weekend and it was just a really amazing time. And for those who just served and loved and made room, I just wanna say thank you. Uh, over the course of uh, six services, we had uh, just under 1300 people come. 
uh, which obviously is uh, more than normal. And, um, and God just did remarkable and beautiful things. And uh, personally, I'm aware of six people who gave their life to Jesus for the first time on Easter Sunday, which um, it matters a lot. And there was just a, a beauty to the morning. And, and, and really, the, you know, the, one of the miraculous things was in the sixth service, which was the eighth service of three days, um, Lindsay was hitting notes she hadn't hit all weekend. And I'm like, Where, what is happening right now? Now, I did call her on Tuesday, and she had no voice. So, you know, eventually I got up with her. But the miracle of all miracles is you put together Good Friday and Easter Sunday. It was, you know, roughly 1,750 people. Not, not all different people. Uh, obviously, a lot of us came to both. But, uh, and that our two toilets stood up. You know what I mean? I mean, that, that's how you know God's hand of kindness is on a community. It, it, it's literally the fact that we survived. Um, but uh, it was just a really beautiful day. And I, I want to say thank you. Uh, I want to say thank you for that. I want to begin um, by walking through our 2022 annual report. And, and I want to share with you the the stewardship of the finances of our church family. But two things to know as we do this about the convictions that we carry. First, is that everything we have and all of the money we have and all of the possessions that belong to us as a church family, first and foremost, belong to Jesus. And we believe that. And second, uh, all of those things also belong to us as an entire community. Uh, they are not mine or a few's, they are all of ours. And that what we have as a church family has great sacred importance in how it is viewed and stewarded. And I understand my role to be the, the steward and the chief leader of how those finances are used and spent, uh, but I want you to know that I do that with a deep conviction about whose finances these are and who I'm serving and stewarding these unto. And as we look at these things, uh, I want you to just see the beauty of what Jesus has been doing among us. And if you've been part of our church family for a while, you've probably heard me share this, but it matters to me to consistently uh, remind uh, of just the way we operate as a church. While I am uh, very involved in the uh, the big picture and the, the management of our finances. Uh, I am not uh, involved in the details of who gives or how much they give. And I've made that decision intentionally. Uh, I think in the beginning it was an intentional decision because I just knew some of the brokenness of my own heart that I refused to allow any place to flourish. I think in time, though, f what it has become for me is that it matters that anyone who walks through the walls of our church would understand that they will never be treated differently based on whether they do or don't give, how much they can or cannot give, or the reality of the financial season of their life. And to me, it, it's a conviction that runs deep within me because people uh, deserve to be treated uh, based on who they are as an image bearer of God, uh, regardless of the financial season or the financial decisions. Uh, in their life. The downside of that, and there are downsides, is that I don't get to say thank you because I am very aware that you give. I'm very aware that you give sacrificially. I'm very aware that there's times you tithe and it hurts. I'm, I'm very aware there's times I call on you for needs and you give and you take from things that could be stewarded for you and your family. And I am really grateful. And I today just want to say thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your devotion to Christ. And I hope that you know that the way we long to lead as pastors and leaders, is something that makes you proud to belong to us uh, because it's, I am very, very proud to belong to you. So when we look at the annual report, let me start with a couple of pictures. The first one 
is just gonna give us some high level understanding of what 2022 was like. We started the year with an annual budget of $1.2 million and our overall giving was just a little over $1.5 million. And just so you know that, uh, that overall giving includes both just general gifts that come in, uh, ties and offerings, general fund giving, and also restricted giving when people give specifically for uh, a, a church plant or give specifically for a missionary or give specifically for uh, our building fund that goes into dedicated categories that only are used for those purposes. So that overall giving number represents both our general and restricted giving. And then uh, our annual spending was uh, just under $1.4 million, $1.388 million, which also includes our both general budget spending as well as our restricted giving and spending. Um, and again, uh, just for me, overwhelmed by the care of God and the care of the people of our church. And in that number of spending uh, is both uh, a decent amount of restricted spending, but also as the year moved forward, we made intentional decisions about places we needed to add to our budget that we originally put in front of us uh, as the church continued to grow and move forward. And I want you to know that in that, all of the financial decisions that we make as a church family are made within our church council. And our church council, or what others might call an elder board, is made up of five people in our community who are members of our church family, voted in by our church family, who help come alongside and steward all of the financial decisions of the church. They have two roles. The first is to care and to be a support structure for me and my family, also a form of accountability where it would ever be required. And second, to walk alongside of me in the financial care and oversight of our church. I am submitted to them and they are submitted to me. And in this mutual submission, we make all of the budgets and financial decisions together, as well as when there are decisions that need to be made outside of what we have budgeted in that. And those five people are Chris Dottel, Jeff Seibert, David Kirchkin, Karen Kay, and Linda Knowles. And I, I see Linda, I'm not sure if any of our council is in here, but the work that they do alongside of me is remarkable, and these are godly men and women filled with the Spirit, with, filled with specific wisdom around finances that on your behalf, on our behalf, are fife, faithfully caring for our church. And so it mattered to me to just say thank you. Linda, would you stand? And uh, as a representation of the council today, that we could just say thank you. Um, And of course, all of the stewardship of our finances is led by uh, Aisha Shambly, who is our financial director. You saw in the video, but she's also here. Aisha, I'm gonna make you do it every service. Will you stand, everybody just say, uh, just thank you to Aisha for all that she's done. And uh, I, I just want you to know that the level of integrity and care and concern uh, Aisha has for you, for your privacy, for honoring you and your finances. She is a meticulous and talented woman and is filled with integrity in ways that deeply matter. And through this, we have created uh, a financial report that uh, you can find a handful of ways. Dave Rompey, who is the master of everything beautiful, uh, created this for us. And on your way out, you're gonna find printed ones that you can grab if you want to. You could also go to the square.org slash give. A PDF is already there online for you. We are also going to email it in our next email. So we just want you to know that you have access to all of the things that I'm sharing today uh, in any way that you want. We function transparently. And part of the beauty of the way we steward the decisions around our finances is that it safeguards against uh, corruption or manipulation or, or deceitful practices. And that you can trust that what you give and how you give becomes faithfully stewarded unto Jesus. And when you look at uh, the next slide, it kind of gives you an idea that's in our, it's in our PDF of, of the breakdown of where that giving went from individual ministries to outreach and mission to staff development to central ministries to facilities to central administration and to personnel. Two, two notes on this. When you look at that phrase or that line, central administration, which is a large number line, part of it is I want you to understand that we as a church family belong to a movement of churches called Foursquare. And it's a decision that we've made that we as a church family tithe unto the movement of churches that we belong to for the movement and the continuation of the gospel. $130,000 of that 193,000 that was spent under central administration was that gift that we do every single month as a church family. 
And this is a decision we make willfully. Uh, This is a decision that we feel is right. And I, I say that because I want you to know that when I talk to you as we did several months ago about how we steward our finances, and I tell you with sincerity that I believe something happens when we live and give to Jesus our first and come to him out of a statement of love and honor out of his leadership over our lives. It is not only something that I want to example first in my own life, but I want us to understand as a community that we participate in. And I believe part of the hand of God's covering and blessing is because we trust him and we give unto him, even as a church family that carries deep levels of trust and love and honor. And the beautiful thing is that money is being moved and spread to bring transformation to pastors and leaders. Foursquare leads hundreds of thousands of churches around the globe, and it's money that comes in the assistance of the care and love for them that in ways we will never know until we see Jesus face to face. And if you just see kind of these closing elements, this is where the finances ended uh, at the end of 2022 that in our general fund, which is a, you know, our, our general checking and savings account, uh, is $885,000. And then our closing building fund is $982,000 and a, a little bit more. And uh, I don't know if you know this, um, but this is not normal for a church. Um, This is not normal. And, uh, and how God has provided and how you have sacrificed means a lot to me. And the safety and the protection and the care that it has provided, um, I, I don't have great words for, but I'm thankful. And it postures us in a season, not only to continue to lead our church family faithfully forward, but to step into greater and greater levels of generosity, which I believe is necessary for us. And I believe even this year, this year alone, we've already given nearly $100,000 away for church planting, needs to become our new normal. And I believe as we, as a community, walk under the hand of God's kindness, I want to grow in greater levels of radical generosity. And so when you look at this year, you just see a lot of beauty and you see a lot of faithfulness. And I just want to say thank you. In the financial report, there are you know, breakdowns and more details. And again, our finances are an open book to you. Where you have questions, you can reach out and we want to get those answers to you. In there, you'll also see uh, a budget for 2023. It matters that we give that to you. And uh, as we've grown and, and continue to move forward, we recognize it's time for us to take a step forward. And our budget for 2023 is $1.45 million. Uh, do you know our first budget was $600 a month? Um, so the still, uh, the word million comes out of my mouth and I'm like, I don't like you. Who are this guy? (laughs) This is weird. Alyssa, it's weird. And, but as that breaks down, you'll just see facilities, all church oversight, square operations. Again, that number also represents in there is the, is the decision we make to tithe back to our movement. Uh, Biblical formation ministry, family ministries, transformation ministries, activation ministries. We've kind of moved into a more complex budget and the, the new categories reflect that of where we are stepping into both the care for our church family and the mission of reaching our neighborhood and the things that God has called us to. One of the things you're going to see in there is, a, is uh, over the last two years, we've taken a, a significant step forward in what well, goes under our personnel budget, which is the salaries of our full-time and part-time pastors, staff, and employees. And actually, this is something I'm really proud of because it's been something I've been longing for for a long time which is that over these last seasons, we uh, actually have finally brought all of the salaries of our pastoral staff uh, to a median wage of what they should be. Uh, We worked with an outside organization that processed, uh, comes alongside churches and processes who they are and uh, the details of of where they are and helps provide for them. This is what uh, comparatively would be a median salary 
for someone in this position. And the truth is, is that pastoral life will always function on a lower uh, pay scale and ceiling than other vocations. But that is a choice and a, and a joy to participate in. And so for me, getting my team to median salaries that rightly honor them for what they do mattered a lot. And uh, they live sacrificially to love and steward this church. And the dream in my heart would not be that we would simply uh, be satisfied at paying our pastors. I have no desire for pastoral ministry to ever make a, a few wealthy. I, I do not hold uh, to those ideologies or beliefs. Uh, but I would long for the day that those who pastor here would not only be able to take care of the present, but be able to take care of the future and to be able to save for their kids. And these are things we're moving towards. My hope is that not only in a few years that we've moved everyone to median salaries for pastors, but we've moved people to median salaries just comparatively to those who live in this area and community. But wherever you see those things, I just tell you, ask questions. This is our money. This is the Lord's money. This is not my money. And everything I want to do is to lead and to faithfully represent that and steward that. And in that, as, as we move into this next season, what it also leads us to is a, an update on our building and our facility. Uh, again, for those who have been part of our church family for a while, this is not a new conversation. Uh, in the beginning of 2018, we began having conversations about an awareness that we had a need for something different. Two primary reasons that has come in front of us. The first is that we're having a hard time facilitating uh, just the community and the church family uh, of who we are as, a, uh, as the square. But second, there are distinct points of obedience, things we feel called to do that we do not have space to do them. There are ministries that are not currently functioning because there's nowhere to house them. There are places of faithfulness and outreach that we feel called to lead and move into that simply requires the space for us to be able to do that. And so for years, we have been praying and pursuing. We've had multiple opportunities. Our first one was that there in 2018, we actually began to think about an abandoned movie theater on South Cobb Drive. It's why we have some funds already in our building fund because we begin to pray and fundraise towards that. Ultimately, we felt that God asked us to not go through with that and we pulled back and stayed where we were. And actually, uh, last year, an opportunity came back around for us to pursue that same exact abandoned movie theater to restore it and return it to a church. And we, again, pursued it until the point where, at the end, we felt like Jesus said, this is not what I have for you, and to wait and trust me. Uh, now, uh, they've imploded the building and nothing's there, by the way. It's just a... It's just a it's just gone, uh, which it needed to be. That's exactly what anybody needed to do with it. Um, and, but it's left us knowing that we have great needs that we are asking God to, to provide for, and we trust him. And when Emily and I moved here 10 years ago, uh, we planted the church out of our home, and, and we got a phone call about a property that somebody was willing to make available to us. And... When we came and we looked at it, um, I don't have a great word, it was decrepit. It was in a pretty bad shape. And uh, I'm, not a, uh, I'm not a talented person when it comes to tools and repairs, and I knew I had absolutely nothing to offer on that front. And I stood in front of this church, and I saw the state it was in. I think there was maybe 25, 30 of us at the time. I saw the, what it would require, what it would cost, and I thought, this is a distraction. This is not a gift. And I said, no. And, but from that moment on, there began to be this like ache and haunt in my own heart. And it was a couple of weeks later, I was in the house I was, we were renting at the time and I was wrestling and I just felt like the Holy Spirit was trying to tell me that this church was a gift to us. And I came, I was actually, it was two in the morning, 2.30 in the morning, I came, I drove, I was just praying, I was restless. I parked right here on Fraser Street, right here on the corner, and I just began to pray and intercede. I just had a, a moment of hearing the heart of God. And he said this really simple phrase to me, if you make these neighborhoods beautiful, uh, I promise I'll make your building beautiful. And in this moment, God did two things. 
First, he met me in my fear. Uh, my fear of failing, my fear of making bad decisions, my fear of stepping into things that would be too costly or painful. Um, and he also, uh, he met me in my arrogance and in the value system I had of being more concerned about the appearance of such things than the substance of them. And it was in his provision and his kindness that we called back and said, if it's still available, we'll take it. And as the story unfolded, what God has done has been remarkable. When we came to the point where we knew we needed a new, to take steps forward, our initial desire was to do that very thing here. Uh, but as you're aware of, on this side of our property is a stream and uh, with a federal and statewide stream buffer. Our church only exists because it's grandfathered in. It breaks every code. Uh, if we were up to code, our church would be past where it currently is uh, at the edge of the building. And, uh, and as that stream functions, it just simply provided, as we had conversations with the city, really no opportunity for us to consider doing any kind of project here. The city just looked at us and said, there's no way to build something and there's no way to house a parking place. There's no way you can do this. And we honored them. We, we understood them. I didn't feel like they were being punitive or unhelpful. I think they were just being honest. And, and we began to look anywhere and everywhere else. But the desire in our heart was always that we would simply be able to stay here. And in this last season, as I met with people, and there's so many people who've helped along the way from Jim LaCroix to uh, Josh Tolbert to Wayne Wright to so many others, we initiated a reimagined conversation. Could we think of staying here? And an idea began to form about what could happen if we piped the stream or environmentally covered the stream so it would not be harmed in any way that would allow us to have full use of the property that we have. What, what many of us don't realize, we own property on the other side of the stream, especially if you go into the far back corner. Many as much of that land is, belongs to us as a church family. And as I came to the mayor uh, of our city and just wanted to share my heart and put in front of him and say, hey, we're at peace with what you decide. We understand, but we want to put in front of you this. And the, the amazing thing is that as I was talking with him, he said back to me, we know that Smyrna is better with the square where it is. And we will do everything we can to keep you where you are. And he began to speak about the ways that you have come alongside Smyrna Elementary and other schools provided in the midst of COVID laptops and food. And I couldn't stop hearing the Lord if you make these neighborhoods beautiful, I will make your building beautiful. That there has been a grace of God towards us and there has been a faithfulness of you. I did not do that. The things he celebrated had nothing to do with me and had everything to do with you and a handful of those in our church community who faithfully lead the way and loving those in the neighborhoods around us. Those like Harrison and Erica, uh, those like those who lead within up tutoring and our foster care ministries and the table at Delk and so many of the other places that we want to rightly represent the name of Jesus through sacrificial love. And what that process began was an opportunity for us to build a new building here. And I wanna give you an idea of where we're at in that. You can go to the next picture. And so uh, what you'll see on the left is like a whole picture of the process. And then on the right is like a zoomed in portion of the same picture. But as we've moved through this, we have come to the place where we have recognized that our ability uh, to build a future actually can exist here. And our plan is that we will build a, an addition and a new property right here on our own church property and family. And what you'll see is where that uh, bottom left building is, that's us, that's where you are right now, that's this building. And part of the joy is that as we build this new property and take these new steps, this building will remain. Uh, it will get more bathrooms though, in the name of Jesus, yes. And, um, but uh, part of that is, one, it's just practically the best decision, but two, it's 
I feel the kindness of God as he leads us into our future that he is also making a statement about our past. And as we move into what is next, this building, which has been such a significant part, not only of our journey, but the church that came, the churches that came before us. Uh, there was a four square church in 1968 that built this building. And I can tell you, they dreamed of you. They longed for you. We have stepped into stories far beyond of what we understand. There was 25, 30 year gap between those two church families. But I'm telling you, the promises of God fill those gaps. And now as we look at this, what it means is so we build the, to the side here. If you look at this, this building, so this is where we are. The upstairs will remain pretty much unchanged. Uh, we'll be able to gather here and do ministry here. And the downstairs will be turned into something that we desperately long for and need, which is creating a full-time food pantry and ability to serve the neighborhoods around us in brand new ways. And then you'll drive in of actually having an in and an out so you can park and those kind of, you know, little things, little things. <laughs> and um, as you move towards there, you'll see that in the middle is going to be a foyer atrium concept that you would walk in. It's the whole building is going to be two stories. Now the sanctuary is only going to be one story, but it'll have the same roof line. And so it'll have a higher sense to it. And as you walk in, it, our desire is that we would create a sense of beauty and wonder, sacred, that, that what God is doing within his church is something sacred. You'll move to the left side on the, or the top, and then on the bottom floor will be all of the area and space we need for our children's ministry and for what we do throughout the week. And then the second floor will be offices and multi-purpose space for ministries. And then on the right will be our gathering space and our sanctuary and where we'll be able to hold and facilitate who we are as a church family and the future that he is moving us towards. And then uh, the, the parking and everything that goes around it. And this is still in design, there's changes. You can go to the next one um, that kind of gives you an idea. Just these, again, same whole image, a zoomed in one. The two pictures are just like trying to show the first floor and the second floor. But it just gives you a concept of what's happening and, and how we're in development phase. I can already tell you that changes have been made from this one. And, uh, and as we walk through this process, we'll continue to keep you updated. What I also want you to see, I know I've made this joke twice, is uh, the amount of bathrooms. I mean, I literally am just like, we need a bathroom there and there and there and there. It's just, people are gonna walk into this building and be like, this got too many bathrooms. They're like, well, there's a, there's a story, there's a story behind that. But um, this is able to allow us to move and to flourish and to thrive into this next season. And uh, it's really an incredible gift. I want to just give you a few additional details and then move towards a close. Um, first, our current estimated start date uh, is we're looking at starting around November of this year, November of 2023, though we're still in certain processes where that number will become more clarified as we move through that. Um, the current estimated cost of the building will be $3.5 million dollars. Uh, which is a joy uh, because as we've gone through this process and recognized what it would be for us to take the step, the amazing thing is building the building we need that is brand new, that is curated just for us, is either half to a third of the price of everything we've looked at that would keep us in our city that would not fully fit or meet our needs. And so while I, I do not make any light comment when, when we're talking about, I do not like spending money on buildings. I want to spend money on the movement of Jesus and people that Jesus loves. I want to change the lives of people around us. These have been hard, complicated, prayer fought days and decisions in the whole last of the five years. But, but what I recognize is that this is an opportunity for us that actually moves us in deep financial faithfulness and integrity and refuses to allow us to build something that puts us into serving a mortgage rather than serving Jesus. It's something I will not do. And we also see that the current estimated construction time is 12 to 16 months. Um, there's a lot of that that just has to do with rain, <laughs> when it rains and what rain does. And our current financial state you saw is that, you know, we have roughly just under a million dollars in our building fund. And we believe we can move close to about $500,000 over from our general fund. And so we're at a starting place of about $1.5 million. And we've already walked through the process 
of our ability to borrow is far more than we would ever want to or need to. And so everything about these next steps is within our financial security and the boundaries that we've established around that. And it's just an incredible gift. I also know that while this kind of creates a, a picture finally of our future, there's a lot of time between now and then. And all I know is this, and Matt, and you can come forward. I'm gonna close. Is we cannot and will not just stay on pause. The mission of Jesus cannot stay on pause. What God is doing in you cannot stay on pause. And I don't know all of the answers of what that means, but I trust God to provide for it. We are really hopeful. We're currently working through plans that would keep our ability to, this building would remain usable throughout the construction process. We don't know that. Uh, yet, there's a lot for us to still figure out, but we are working towards that in an active conversations with the city around that. But as we continue to move forward, uh, we will be able to answer those questions more detailed. Just next steps. One, we're just going to continue the design and the permitting phase. Uh, we have to land on the exact kind of nature and structure for civil engineers to be able to fulfill our permits for us to continue. And it's then that we'll have a lot more concrete timeline. In that, we are going to create forums, places of question and answer, that these are decisions that we can talk through together and that you can understand everything that's happening and what we're making. And we just know that as we move forward, uh, we, as we have felt for a while when this time comes, we'll take time uh, to to invite people to give. And I just want to say to you in that is that, um, that I just recognize that people are in this room who have given to other places or things or organizations and felt like the communication of that or the stewardship of that or the, the way that's been handled did not feel like Jesus or look like Jesus. And I just tell you that um, as we walk through this, I'll do everything I can to communicate honestly, sincerely, what I believe God is saying, what I believe my own heart is saying. These are not decisions I make alone. These are decisions I make alongside of our pastoral staff and our church council and our church community. And when the time comes that we invite people to give, that I'll invite you simply to give what you feel is right in your own heart and what you feel is right before the Lord. And we will not steward this season in, in a way that makes you feel pressured or coerced or manipulated in any way. And I believe that God has his hand on us for a, a moment that matters into our future. Let me close just simply with reading two passages and exhorting you out of them. First Peter 5 says, To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording over those who are entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade. First Peter 5 is Peter writing to pastors. Um, and obviously it holds deep personal meaning for me and for others. And in it are just these invitations of what it looks like to be faithful for those who lead in the name of Jesus. He says to care for those who belong to your community purely, willingly, from your love and faithfulness to Jesus, not out of a false sense of duty. He's talking about sincere love over obligation or obligated duty. He's saying to pastor from the heart of a servant, putting the good of your congregation above your own, not looking to use your role manipulatively for dishonest gain. He's talking about servant-hearted sacrifice over selfish gain. 
It says to lead your community to serve Jesus by going first into faithfulness and sacrifice, not lording your status over others to have them serve you. It's talking about embodied faithfulness over status curation and to live for the joy and the reward of Jesus, trusting him as the true pastor of your church, not looking for the things of this world for value. And he's talking about devotion to Christ over love for the world. Paul similarly in 2 Corinthians 4 just says this, therefore, since through God's mercy, we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And similarly, a word about what it means to pastor rightly. First, he says to minister from purity and integrity, refusing to allow secretive, shameful, deceptive, or manipulative practices. He's really, it's, it's about integrity over manipulation. But then he says to teach the truth honestly and plainly, refusing to distort the authority of scripture or preach a partial gospel. And he's talking about biblical faithfulness over cultural compromise. These six things matter a lot. It's the greatest desire of my life that I would be I would give myself to all of them. I am as human as you are. So I'm aware of the days and the moments I fall short. But with good heart and conscience, I can tell you that this is the aim of my life and our life. And the truth is the beauty of these six things is that they aren't just the desire of God for the heart of what pastors should lead, they reveal the values that his people should hold. And these six things, sincere love, servant-hearted sacrifice, embodied faithfulness, devotion to Christ, leadership, integrity, and biblical faithfulness. I can just tell you this is the roadmap of our future. And these are the very things that we will continue to yield and will never allow to be changed in our lives. I have dreams, we have dreams, we have plans, we have deep senses of calling and future, we have things that we know with all of our heart God has placed in front of us and invited us to do. But let me just tell you, none of them compare to our desire to be faithful to Jesus, none of them. The presence of God is our promised land. We'll wander in the desert with him over any security without him. We will choose faithfulness with him no matter what it takes from us because it is the value of our lives and it is the value of the church. And so church family, I just say, I love you. God is kind. The way he has cared for us is beyond comparison. And the way you have stood with us I don't have great words, but I want to just say one more time, thank you. And the days are coming where the dreams of our hearts are gonna find their way forward. And I can't wait to be a part of them with you. So where you have questions, just ask. Come on, will you stand with me? Let me pray. Prayer teams are available. Jesus, we love you. We honor you. And we recognize that all that we do is our greatest attempt to live faithfully to you and to love others in your name. Continue to lead us and guide us and refine us in every way. Correct us where we're wrong and give us courage where we need it. We trust you and we love you in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, listen on your way out, just as a reminder, you can grab this financial report or there is a invitation to men's retreat. May God bless you and keep you cause his face to shine upon you. May he turn his countenance to you and may you know everywhere you go, you are radically loved by Jesus. Go have fun at the ministry fair. Go get connected into all of the things happening in our church. Love you.